good morning. And I really enjoyed the last session, and I think uh, this talk will dovetail fairly nicely with that. Um, this is my most dense and horrible slide, and it will not occur again. But I wanted to give you the overview of my trajectory thus far. So I started out as a research scientist in solar physics at NCAR and the High Altitude Observatory in Boulder. Um, and via the University of Colorado, earned my doctorate and went on a postdoc to Cambridge University. My first contact with AGCI was right around there in 1990, the first uh, meeting. And so this was a big dose of cross-disciplinary uh, communication. I spent some time as a math and science educator at the University of Colorado. And there is where I got the really big taste of how math and science education could be used in service to a bigger agenda in terms of developing human capacity for cognitive uh, development and, um, and beyond. So I then got whisked off to a visiting scientist appointment at NASA headquarters. And there I got deeply involved in strategic planning, policy development, and served as a program officer and saw the enormous power of integrating education programs in scientific research environments. And I'll say more about that. Uh, this little interlude and a semester long voyage around the world was a, an enormous influence. I then came back and served for an extended time as the Director of Education and Public Outreach at a research and education institution called the Space Science Institute, also based in Boulder, Colorado. Um, there I served as a broker facilitator, so called, as part of a network that was matching resources of the space science and sometimes earth science research community with educational needs in a nine state region of the American West. That caused me to have quite a bit of contact with indigenous students and educators in the Navajo and Sioux reservations, also in Chaco Canyon. And I saw this possibility of creating a new synthesis of traditional and modern perspectives and understanding where people were coming from, whether from a more traditional or modern or even postmodern model in terms of communicating with them. Strengthening the capacity of educators in space and earth science and developing the capacity of scientists to become more effective partners in education. I want to say here that when we started, AGU had two sessions, one session in education. That, this, these were the days when there was one opportunity and we were doing it uh, you know, for the whole of AGU. Now, of course, most of you know there are 30 sessions on education and communication and in the beginning, the Space Physics and Aeronomy Division was doing one little session that included all the disciplines. Now each of their disciplines have things, communication has one, everybody, all of the different disciplines are participating and doing their own thing. So that has been an enormous change in these last 25 years in regards to the presence of education and communication issues at AGU. Second contact with AGCI um, involved uh, a workshops within workshops, and I'll say a little bit more about that, but we did both workshops for educators in science and workshops for scientists about education in the context of a meeting like this. And then I served as a professor of physics and astronomy at Georgia State University for a while. Their physics education innovation, I'll say more about this, recognizing student values and reframing it uh, in, a, in the deep south uh, from dogma to inquiry or to make a comparison between dogma and inquiry. And awakening to epistemological concerns in regards to the combination of quantitative and qualitative research, integrating of art, music, and science and service to education. This is a big developmental time for me, having switched from Boulder, Colorado to the downtown of Atlanta, Georgia. Okay? This was an enormous sort of mind and heartbreaking change. And the first two years, I wanted to run back to Boulder, of course. Um, having stayed on for uh, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth year, I really um, now see it as one of the most important turning points in my life in terms of re seeing how most of humanity is living right now. Okay? If I'd stayed in Boulder the rest of my life, I would definitely not be aware of the things that uh, became apparent uh, in Atlanta. Okay? <laughs> Just saying. I, I have a condo in Boulder. I love Boulder. Okay? <laughs> What's that? I, 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 I understood. I know, Bill. <laughs> and I know I, I, I love my friends in Boulder. Okay, also then finally, um, you know, reconnecting with AGCI. And I realized that AGCI has threaded throughout my trajectory thus far. It's about twice as long as our previous speaker. You know, um, he's 15 years in, I'm 30 years in, or something like that. Um, 
And uh, this becomes important, is communication versus education. And a lot of the questions that arose in the, in the aftermath of the previous session really, um, I think, can be helped by thinking more deeply about this framing, about what we mean, what are the overlaps, and what are the places that we really try to distinguish them. And of course, nothing is utterly distinguishable. I swear I made this slide before Jeff Keel spoke yesterday. <laughs> I, I re honestly, I, when I saw his slide, I said, wow, you know, it's like 80%, 90% overlap. In terms of my graduate days at NCAR, these are the kind of interdisciplinarian science and society folks who were an enormous influence on me. And as I watched them, uh, uh, you know, Walt Roberts and I were both had the courage to be scientific tour guides, right, in, at, at NCAR. And we would point to each other and say, oh, yeah, look, there's the best tour guide at NCAR. And anyway, it was a, it was a heady time. In, at University of Colorado, I ran a band of interdisciplinary teaching assistants of math. As soon as I left for NASA, of course, they were taken over by all math majors. But these are graduate and undergraduate students in history, philosophy, English, all of whom had a year of calculus and knew what it meant to work with math phobic people in an introductory course called Quantitative Reasoning and Mathematical Skills. And this is where I really came to understand that a math or science course, especially if one were afraid or uneasy with the content, could change your life, not just give you a little bit more content. Okay? So you really could change the way people are thinking about things, the way they're feeling about their intellectual confidence, the way they feel about their capacity to communicate with others. Heady days at NASA headquarters. This is Jeff Hoffman, very amazing guy, Hubble repair astronaut, the NASA administrator and a space policy pundit. And this was an, op an opportunity while I was at NASA exploring policies and strategies for integrating the education agenda in K-12 and in formal science education, not just you know, um, the graduate education and postdoc. I was also challenged, if you over drinks, I'll tell you the challenging encounters with Stephen Hawking as a postdoc and with Carl Sagan at a meeting about the effective, how NASA could more effectively communicate with the public. He got up and said I was full of it when I said scientists should be involved in education. And he, uh, that was very interesting. Um, Atlanta is one of the partial homes of the Dalai Lama. He's associated with Emory University. Uh, there was an encounter there that was highly influential in regard to opening myself to the notion of um, epistemological reaches, that reductionist materialism was an underlying philosophical assumption of science and we needed to have other ways that were possible of knowing and recognizing that people were knowing that way. So we were really working on embedding education programs inside space missions, inside research institutes, inside professional societies, and I really became interested in exploring space-based perspectives to help out in earth science, earth system science, I should say, got some uh, in education. This was first contact with AGCI, and there was this seminal book called the Ground Truth Studies Teacher Handbook. So a pioneering product involved close partnership between scientists and educators, and it helped lay a foundation for the GLOBE program, where students are actively involved in, in going out in the field and providing data that uh, feeds into authentic research projects. So also I noted, that Susan was one of the primary writers on a version of this, and so she's gone from you know, this teacher handbook, which is still out there, also to now the National Climate Assessment, you know, so uh, long trajectories. We also were very involved in doing K-12 education workshops for scientists, engineers, and what education and public outreach professionals, these bridger community that rose up. We did this for 10 years in association with the National, uh, with the Space Science Institute funded by NASA and the NSF. Um, started, the NRC started talking about the role of scientists in the professional development of teachers and so on. Uh, Richard's involvement in the professional development of teachers also resulted in this book that he showed you in his presentation. Um, and that was a really powerful way to make a popular read out of involvement in education. And so uh, this is the beginning of that. Also part of the second contact with AGCI was uh, a contact with Roger Bybee, and he was Bruce Albert's right-hand man. Bruce Alberts was the uh, National Academy uh, of Science uh, president, and we got him to come to an AGCI session. He saw a roles matrix for scientists in education that I had created and was in the process of making a publication for the Forum on Education. 
and he uh, basically invited that Rolls matrix to go there. And it turns out um, that you know that's one of the most read and downloaded uh, of the articles there. So that was a very uh, interesting turning point. Uh, you may recognize a younger version of one of our previous speakers this morning, actually two of them, <laughs> counting me. Um, but we, would, we did a workshop within an AGCI session for scientists about education. It involved things, oh, we also did a workshop um, for NASA senior uh, earth science uh, managers, and this was something that was supported by Gossam uh, in 2002. And so we were taking this model around of how to communicate with scientists about not becoming experts in education, but becoming enough aware that they would be better partners in education. And it's the long-lived partnership with a guy like Richard or a guy like Guy, you know, these long-lived partnerships, a guy like John, where you're developing each other over time as you collaborate. So the partnership is not a one-off workshop that you go to. It's the relationships that you have that then help you apply. So I get the leading edge of climate science research in my efforts, and they get what I know about education and climate research, or sorry, education and communication research. So we would say to them, students as scientists with teachers as facilitators of learning, teacher as guide on the side rather than sage on the stage, that's good communication, right, in the context of uh, telling about education. And an inquiry process of teaching and learning, the way scientists do science rather than the way they were taught. If those were the takeaways from such a workshop, then great. Now I want to uh, have a test. Go ahead and read that for a couple of minutes. It's about the monotillation of Traxlene, as you know, class. And I'm going to ask you a few questions. You ready? What is Traxelene, please? Thank you very much. New form of Zyanter, excellent. Where is it monotilled? Excellent. You are so smart. How is Traxelene quasled? So that's a little harder question. Excellent. Very good. Why is it important to know? You get the idea that. You know, jargon can come across, you can get a little feedback from people and say, oh, wow, they're getting it. What are they getting? I could put up a, na I could put, I could put up a, a, a nature abstract in, in some very detailed line of research and it would come across the same way, right? So, it, it, no. <laughs> it makes you feel smart. It, it very much does make you feel smart. So the other big lesson that we would offer is that people are not blank slates, they come with preconceived ideas. Now this is fundamental foundational research for both science ed education and science communication, as I'm going to say in a minute. And so we would, in education we get into the sort of ideas of constructivist learning theory. We gave talks about what we were learning um, and John was involved in this, became more involved. Uh, this was at the AGU Chapman conference. I went into this conference thinking, well, you know, education's a form of communication or one's a subset of the other or something. Came away, no, wrong. Much different idea. So I started making this comparison chart, which relates to a lot of the comments that were made earlier, right, about, um, you know, some of the concerns people have. And what are you doing? Are you communicating? Are you educating? Shorter context, longer context, di uh, time frame, different contexts of practice, the nature of your message, well-framed three-point messages, sound bites of you avoid use of math and jargon. Here, we want to cultivate the appropriate use of math and jargon, and we want age-appropriate lessons. Maybe this is more about influencing opinion or behavior. This is a s serious abstraction, okay, of a, a more evolved chart that's uh, in development. Here we want conceptual understanding and explanations. We want to develop skepticism. Science educators go bonkers when we refer to people who are climate deniers or confusionists or whatever it is as skeptics because skepticism is something a science educator wants to cultivate so that people can discern when dogma or evidence-based inquiry is being enacted. And I tell them some of my colleagues in education are giving you a kind of dogmatic presentation of science. Dogma does not have to confine itself to religions or whatever. If somebody is uh, uh, not asking you to consider evidence-based inquiry, you, making this discernment is part of what we do when we're trying to educate someone versus trying to influence their opinion and behavior. Scientists, of course, are doing both of these things. They're both practitioners, and uh, we have specialists, of course, who are science communicators and science educators as well. Here's an example I hope to have time to get across here. CO2 is pollution. This is used in the president's strategic plan, right? 21 times on 23 pages. CO2 pollution, which implies CO2 is toxic, like mercury, 
right? And then CO2 is plant food, mean, connoting that CO2 is good. Pollution bad, right? Uh, plant food good. But who's using these arguments? Here's the president um, trying to get across that we need to do something about excessive CO2. Is it making a scientifically accurate statement? Well, um, not really. You can argue with this. This could backfire. Is it offering a science-based idea about how we need to respond? Well, yeah. You know, we can argue this. CO2 is plant food. Is it scientifically? Yes, it's scientifically accurate. Is it, it's, it, this is used by climate deniers intended to deceive, well, what's the problem? CO2 in the atmosphere, right? It's plant food, so it must be good. And so you can see that there's some conflation. And an educator is trying to tease this apart, right? An educator forced, but people making these different kinds of communication efforts is forced to go deeper, go into the systemic connections that make these sort of partially true, but not entirely true. And so this is where I think we need to frame. This was a laboratory for my learning. Uh, I got this with my startup package as a professor at Georgia State University. Collaborative learning, longer blocks, you can really impact a life on this. I'm an advocate of teaching that is transformational rather than informational, and that's another kind of distinction. Um, I reference Robert Keegan there. I had a lot of science-religion tension going on in my classroom uh, in the Southeast, and I reframed it as inquiry versus dogma. That was partially inspired by reading the Dalai Lama's universe uh, in a single atom. Also, systems thinking and seeing interconnections. This was a marvelous learning environment. AV equipped, whiteboards all over the boards, uh, you know, nice equipment. A straight science talk can work for the proper audience. Richard came, said, I'm going to talk to you about science. Here's what the current science mainstream is. It's not an example of a failing deficit model, right? Um, which was in the quote that, um, and that deserves more conversation perhaps. Undergraduates are in a powerful time in life to challenge their conditioned ideas. When they come to you with something Rush Limbaugh said, because that's what their family is listening to, they're not climate deniers, they really want to know if there's another perspective on this. Right? And so when Richard offered this perspective, we actually took data to see about how things might have shifted during the course of that. And we had many responses that there was a willingness, maybe I need to rethink this. Last thing, concept inventory on climate change. We used an introductory class in weather and climate uh, that was highly populated, 400 to 500 people per semester, to develop a research-based inventory, much like the uh, physics community's uh, concept inventory. Um, it tests not on opinion, but on concepts, science concepts underlying climate change. Lots of different audiences can make use of it. This is the one that it's validated for at the moment. These are other places where it might be tested out. This is our content validity, derives predominantly from the national consensus document entitled Climate Literacy, the Essential Principles of Climate Science. So it's a multi-agency thing, and a lot of scientists and educators, perhaps some of you, have been involved in that. So this, John stepped into this unfunded, uh, and we had the executive director of assessment and evaluation. I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. We did invited talks on this uh, inventory at both the Geological Society of America and the American Geophysical Union this past fall. This was this context. We convened educators in arts, music, and science all together. And I will stop there. I want to say the national next generation science standards actually have explicit language about climate education for the first time. They have explicit language about climate change in the national science education standards. And the project to enliven the archive for educational purposes is there. So here are some ideas based on this talk, my last slide about the future of AGCI. And that leaves one minute for Good. questions. I hope. <laughs> yes. Um, so since you focused on undergraduate education, I'd like um, to know what you think about the feeders into that, meaning high school education and then um, graduate level education, how it fits into, I mean, you made a really compelling case for being life transforming when you're an undergraduate, but can you comment on either what's necessary going into that or coming out of that and the importance of those relative? Of course, it helps that undergraduate educator a lot if the K-12 preparation is good. I lived in an environment where the spectrum of student was from people who belonged in Ivy League schools to people who, I'm not sure how they got out of middle school, right, in terms of their preparation. And so that's one of the big challenges uh, in undergraduate. I think it's vital to start early. 
uh, with this kind of thing and show people that they're developing human beings and that they um, can begin to discern what evidence means versus somebody who's just telling you what to believe in whatever context you encounter it. I think going on to graduate school, I think it's really important that we expose, somebody said this, we expose our graduate students to epistemology and to ethics and to a practice of doing education, right? Somehow reaching out to the school they came from or back into the undergraduate. However that happens, that sort of near peer interface, undergraduates doing research, going back into their high school, right? And that we connect the levels and make these bridges, which I think are really important. Yeah.